Hello, and thank you for joining me for this second lesson on Roman Catholic Gospel Distinctives. Today, we're going to consider the Church. The Roman Church has great antiquity, and Paul wrote that he looked forward to visiting the Church, whose faith was already heralded throughout the world. And many who have come to the Roman Catholic Church in recent times are very passionate that in doing so, they have come home to the historical and true church, the mother church of the faithful, in whose bosom oh, they can alone find a secure and solid foundation. They come to Rome for the authentic apostolic tradition that's been continually held and practiced in all ages, including its ancient and universal government that was instituted by Christ himself through Peter, that rock on which Christ builds his church. What is distinctive about the Roman church and what must be believed about it? We'll begin with what Rome considers de fide, what must be believed by all of its members for salvation. What's taught by the infallible magisterium of the church as divinely revealed and therefore irreformable and once again, we'll be giving special attention to the teaching of Rome's ecumenical councils rather than the catechism or other writings because of their supreme authority. Vatican I defines what must be believed about the church in order to be saved, and it declares its anathema, condemning all who deny this. We teach and declare, they write, that by the appointment of our Lord, the Roman Church possesses a sovereignty of ordinary power over all other churches, and that this power of jurisdiction of the Roman pontiff requires submission not only in matters which belong to faith and morals, but also in those that pertain to the discipline and government of the Church throughout the world. This is the teaching of the Catholic truth from which no one can deviate without loss of faith and salvation. It's very important to note that the Council grounds this important teaching as being in full accordance with the ancient and constant faith of the Universal Church. And also how the Universal Church has always understood the Holy Scripture. This doctrine has been ever understood by the Catholic Church, this primary of jurisdiction that is known to all ages. Pope Leo XIII later wrote an encyclical called Satis Cognitum, in which he presses home the teachings of Vatican I and calls the Universal Church to return to Rome, since, he says, the fathers of the Vatican Council laid down nothing new but the acknowledged and invariable teaching of the church and he says that the practice of the church which has always been the same according to the unanimous teaching of the fathers is that the church must put outside its communion anyone who denies this or the least point of official doctrine and he quotes origin we should believe not otherwise that has been handed down by the tradition of the Church of God. Now, the Church is an essential gospel distinctive for Rome, for all salvation comes from Christ through the Church, the New Catechism says. And what about others? Well, in his famous bull on the One Holy Church, Unum Sanctum, Pope Boniface VIII wrote, Therefore, if Greeks or others should say that they are not confided to Peter and to his successors, they must confess not being the sheep of Christ, since our Lord says in John, there is one sheepfold and one shepherd. And in the final line of that document, he concludes, We declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. However, as we saw last time, this is qualified in Vatican II in the following way, which says, 
Whoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved. Nevertheless, the Second Vatican Council reaffirms the previous councils, and it is clear that not only the Church's teaching, but also the Church's reason for believing in the universal primacy of Rome's power must be firmly believed by all. And on a more personal note, no matter how people feel about any particular pope, people are drawn to these Roman Catholic distinctives, which I'll summarize using the language of the Council. Roman Catholics believe and must believe that they are holding the ancient and constant faith of the universal church, which has been known in all ages that the apostle Peter presides and judges to this day and always in his successors in Rome. In particular, the Lord, through Peter, gave the Roman church a primacy of jurisdiction, meaning that Rome has always had the supreme rule over all other Christians and churches who must give it true obedience, not only in faith and morals, but also in discipline and government, the Pope being the vicar of Christ himself. And by this supremacy, the Catholic or universal church is held together as one flock under one supreme pastor, preserving the unity both of communion and of the profession of the same faith with the Roman pontiff. And since the Roman teaching is uh, infallible in its uh, magisterium, as the council goes on to say, Roman Catholics can always have confidence in knowing just what to believe. This universal teaching known to all ages regarding Rome's antiquity, supremacy, and unity is an essential teaching of the church from which no one can deviate without loss of faith and salvation. Vatican I's document on this subject is well named as Pastor Eternus, that is, the eternal pastor. And so, having this foundation of the testimony of the universal church in all ages, many Roman Catholics think that if Orthodox and Protestants would just look into history or read the Church Fathers, they would soon agree and join them. But meanwhile, of course, the Orthodox and Protestants think the very reverse, that if Catholics would just look into history or read the Church Fathers, they would soon come to the opposite conclusion. Well, why is there such a sharp divide on this important question? Many Roman Catholics have never heard any explanation. How could there be widely divergent views on the ancient and constant faith and practice of the universal church as manifested in the unanimous teaching of the fathers? This is a very interesting story. Something else happened at Vatican II. As I mentioned in my previous video, there was a new openness to engage in ecumenical relations and dialogue, and soon after Vatican II, Roman Catholic scholars began officially meeting with both Protestant and Orthodox scholars to pursue unity in the truth. They began to go back to the sources and to compare notes on the history of the Church and the writings of the Church Fathers, and when they did, scholars at the highest levels of the Roman Catholic Church began to say some very striking things. For example, in 2016, the Joint International Commission for Theological Dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church put forth a document signed in the Italian city of Chieti by representatives of the Roman Church as well as every Orthodox Church except the Bulgarian, which has steadfastly refused to participate in ecumenical dialogue with Rome. This joint document was then posted prominently on the Vatican website, but it didn't generate anywhere near as much press or interest as I would have expected, given what it says. The whole document deserves your study, including the footnotes. It's called Synodality and Primacy During the First Millennium, Toward a Common Understanding in Service to the Unity of the Church. And I'll come back to it in a moment. But it has many very surprising statements in light of what we just read that Roman Catholics are required to believe about the ancient and constant faith of the whole church regarding Roman primacy and the reasons for it. For example, it says, in the West, the primacy of the See of Rome was understood 
particularly from the 4th century onwards, with reference to Peter's role among the apostles. The primacy of the Bishop of Rome among the bishops was gradually interpreted as a prerogative that was his because he was the successor of Peter, first of the apostles. This understanding was not adopted in the East. Over the centuries, it says, a number of appeals were made to the Bishop of Rome, Constantinople, and to other sees. Such appeals to major sees were always treated in a synodical way. Appeals to the Bishop of Rome from the East expressed the communion of the Church, but the Bishop of Rome did not exercise canonical authority over the Churches of the East. This joint statement makes very striking claims about both the historical practice and the historical faith of the Universal Church. And given the official position of the Vatican Councils that we just read about, the ancient and constant faith of the Universal Church and how the practice of the Church has always been the same and so forth, someone will very reasonably ask, what happened at Chieti? Is this just a few rogue bishops or scholars in Italy? No, not at all. Here's a statement produced by delegates from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and their Lutheran counterparts. It's called Papal Primacy and the Universal Church, published back in 1974 as a result of the Lutheran Roman Catholic Dialogue in the U.S. It says, with Leo I, the correlation between the Bishop of the Roman Church and the image of Peter which had already been suggested by some of his predecessors, became fully explicit. This is surprising because Leo the Great became Bishop of Rome in AD 440. The scholars are speaking not just for themselves, they say, but any biblical and historical scholar today would consider anachronistic the question whether Jesus constituted Peter the first pope since this question derives from a later model of the papacy, which it projects back into the New Testament. Well, just what kind of biblical and historical scholars are we talking about, someone will ask. Well, here's the summary of Dominican Cardinal Yves Hongar, who played such a large and influential role at Vatican II, uh, one EWTN article calls him, quote, certainly one of the three or four most important Catholic theologians of the 20th century. He writes, But it does sometimes happen that some fathers understood a passage in a way that does not agree with later church teaching. One example, the interpretation of Peter's confession in Matthew 16, verses 16 through 19. Except at Rome... This passage was not applied by the fathers to the papal primacy. Indeed, it was not even applied in Rome that way until the middle of the third century. Here is Professor Richard McBrien, who passed away in 2015, but he was a Roman Catholic scholar. He served as chairman of the Department of Theology at Notre Dame, president of the Catholic Theological Society of America, and he was the general editor of the HarperCollins Encyclopedia of Catholicism, among several other works. He wrote, There is increasing agreement among historians and biblical scholars that Peter did go to Rome. However, there is no evidence that before his death, Peter actually served the Church of Rome as its first bishop, even though the fact is regularly taken for granted by a wide spectrum of Catholics and others. Indeed, there is no evidence that Rome even had a mono-episcopal form of ecclesiastical government until the middle of the second century. By the late second or early third century, however, Peter did become identified in tradition as the first bishop of Rome. But tradition is not a fact factory. It cannot make something into an historical fact when it is not. Monoepiscopal, of course, means having only one bishop or overseer, 
over the, the church in the area as opposed to a plurality. Compare, for example, 1 Clement 44, Acts 20, or Titus 1. Well, if Peter wasn't the first bishop of Rome, and Christ's promise to Peter wasn't even connected to the bishop of Rome until later, and the bishop of Rome never exercised jurisdiction over the whole church, what happened? The ecumenical dialogue happened, where they began reading the fathers and church history again together in context. And the leaders of the Roman church recognized that not only for the sake of truth, but also for the pursuit of unity, Rome must give up its claims to be maintaining the faith and practice which has ever been understood and known to all ages regarding Peter and his successors, the bishops of the Holy See of Rome, as the council said. Rome has historically viewed such claims as the basis of unity. However, the rest of the church has regarded them not only as false, but also as schismatic. A large part of what split the church and what still keeps it apart today. Progress, therefore, depended on Rome's agreement regarding the actual faith and practice of the church in history. And therefore, Cardinal Ratzinger, later, of course, Pope Benedict XVI, wrote, In fact, Rome must not require more from the East with respect to the doctrine of primacy than had been formulated and lived for the first millennium. Reunion could take place in this context if the West would recognize the Church of the East as orthodox and legitimate in the form she has always had. Well, how then in just a few years did they go from saying that the universal testimony of the faith and practice of the church in all ages was one thing to saying it's another thing. This story is highly interesting, and it's surely one of the most important stories in church history, though it's only been trickling out from scholars. Biblical and historical scholars may be in the know, but the vast majority of others are not, and that's what we'll be considering for the remainder of this video. But first, we should briefly review how the Chiedi document summarizes the actual faith and practice of the Catholic Church in the first millennium, and then we'll learn how this was lost and found again in Rome. This document that is available still on the Vatican website is called Synodality and Primacy During the First Millennium, signed in Chiedi, the 21st of December, 2016. In the interest of time, I'm only going to hit a number of highlights, but the whole document is very well worth reading. It is not long. Please read its footnotes as well as the many references to church councils and fathers. But let's begin with some highlights. From the earliest times, the one church existed as many local churches. The communion of the Holy Spirit was experienced both within each local church and in the relations between them as a unity in diversity. Under the guidance of the Spirit, the church developed patterns of order and various practices. Synodality is a fundamental quality of the church as a whole. As John Chrysostom said, church means both gathering and synod. The term comes from the word council, synodos in Greek, conchilium in Latin. The term primacy refers to being the first primus, or protos. Christian tradition makes it clear that within the synodical life of the church at various levels, a bishop has been acknowledged as the first Already during the first four centuries, various groupings of dioceses within particular regions emerged. The Protoss, the first among the bishops of the region, was the bishop of the first see, the metropolis, and his office as metropolitan was always attached to his see. 
The ecumenical councils attributed certain prerogatives to the metropolitan, always within the framework of synodality. Apostolic Canon 34 offers a canonical description of the correlation between the protos and the other bishops of each region. Quote, the bishops of the people of a province or region must recognize the one who is first among them and consider him to be their head and not do anything important without his consent. Each bishop may only do what concerns his own diocese and its dependent territories, but the first cannot do anything without the consent of all, for in this way concord will prevail, and God will be praised through the Lord in the Holy Spirit. Between the 4th and 7th centuries, the order of the five patriarchal sees came to be recognized based on and <clears throat> sanctioned by ecumenical councils, with the See of Rome occupying the first place, exercising a primacy of honor, followed by the Sees of Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem in that specific order, according to the canonical tradition. In the West, the primacy of the See of Rome was understood, particularly from the 4th century onward, with reference to Peter's role among the apostles, the primacy of the Bishop of Rome among the bishops was gradually interpreted as a prerogative that was his because he was successor of Peter, the first of the apostles. This understanding was not adopted in the East, which had a different interpretation of the scriptures and the fathers on this point. Our dialogue may return to this matter in the future. Over the centuries, a number of appeals were made to the Bishop of Rome, also from the East, in disciplinary matters, such as the deposition of a bishop, an attempt was made at the Synod of Sardica in 343 to establish rules for such a procedure. Sardica was received at the Council in Trullo, 692. The canons of Sardica determined that a bishop who'd been condemned could appeal to the Bishop of Rome and that the latter, if he deemed it appropriate, might order a retrial to be conducted by the bishops in the province neighboring the bishop's own. Appeals regarding disciplinary matters were also made to the See of Constantinople and to other sees. Such appeals to major sees were always treated in a synodical way. Appeals to the Bishop of Rome from the East expressed the communion of the Church, but the Bishop of Rome did not exercise canonical authority over the churches of the East. When you read through the short document, please also be sure to read the footnotes that give special attention to the Church's statements in Ecumenical Council. Here's footnote 11 in its entirety. Compare the First Ecumenical Council of Nicaea 325, Canon 6, the ancient customs of Egypt, Libya, and Pentapolis shall be maintained according to which the Bishop of Alexandria has authority over all these places, since a similar custom exists with reference to the Bishop of Rome. Similarly, in Antioch and the other provinces, the prerogatives of the churches are to be preserved. Second Ecumenical Council of Constantinople, 381, Canon 3, let the Bishop of Constantinople have the primacy of honor after the Bishop of Rome, because it is New Rome. It continues, and this is an important one, the Fourth Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon in 451, Canon 28, reads, The Fathers rightly accorded prerogatives to the See of Older Rome, since that is an imperial city. And, moved by the same purpose, the 150 most devout bishops apportioned equal prerogatives to the Most Holy See of New Rome reasonably judging that the city which is honored by the imperial power and senate and enjoying privileges equaling older imperial Rome should also be elevated to her level in ecclesiastical affairs and take second place after her. They add, this canon was never received in the West. And finally, Council in Trullo, 692, Canon 36, Renewing the enactments of the 150 fathers assembled at the God-protected and imperial city 
and those of the 630 who met at Chalcedon, we decree that the see of Constantinople shall have equal privileges with the see of old Rome, and shall be highly regarded in ecclesiastical matters as that see is and shall be second after it. After Constantinople shall be ranked the see of Alexandria, then that of Antioch, and afterwards the see of Jerusalem. That is the basic outline of history from the Chiedi document, and perhaps if you're a Protestant, you might shrug your shoulders at all this and say, well, that's just exactly what's taught in any standard church history textbook. However, this is new for many in Rome, and it's time to talk about why and what happened, how this was lost and rediscovered. Let me highlight a couple of the differences that we're going to be seeing. The Roman Catholic Council said that the Petrine primacy of the See of Rome, or in other words, the Pope's supreme government and authority, as given by the Lord through Peter, was the ancient and constant faith of the universal church. These Roman Catholic scholars are saying that this understanding develops gradually, particularly from the fourth century onward, and was never adopted in the East. Second, Roman Catholic Council said that Peter and his successors have a primacy of jurisdiction because Christ gave the rule and supremacy to them. The Roman Catholic scholars said that Rome was given a primacy of honor because it was an imperial city, quoting those early ecumenical councils. Third, concerning the church's unity, the Roman Catholic councils described the ancient and constant faith of the universal church about the institution, perpetuity and nature of the primacy by which the strength and solidity of the entire church is established. However, the Roman scholars are saying that Rome never exercised canonical authority over the churches of the East. And finally, whereas the council declared that no one can deviate from its universal faith without loss of salvation, then Cardinal Ratzinger advocated that the Orthodox Church should be recognized as Orthodox and legitimate in the form she has always had. While this might be utterly perplexing to some Roman Catholics, and even if Orthodox and Protestants agree with the conclusions of the scholars, they might be just as perplexed at what happened. How could the whole history and literature of the Church for so many centuries be read to say one thing and now another? Well, for the rest of the time, we will consider it. What happened? Let me introduce it to you by going back to the 13th century to the writings of Thomas Aquinas, who's now enjoying some renewed interest in many quarters today. Pope Urban IV was seeking a reunion with the churches to the East, so the Pope asked Aquinas, as papal theologian, to write a treatise to explain and justify the Roman Catholic position on certain dividing doctrines, showing the whole world why Rome's faith is the true and universal faith of the historical church. Aquinas didn't give his work this title, but it was later called Contra Erroris Graecorum, that is, Against the Errors of the Greeks. Well, here are the two chapters on the Pope's universal primacy of power. Chapter 34, that the Roman pontiff possesses in the church a fullness of power. It is also established from the texts of the aforementioned doctors that the Roman pontiff possesses a fullness of power in the church. For Cyril, Patriarch of Alexandria, says Christ entrusted most fully the fullest power to Peter and his successors. And again, to no one else but Peter and to him alone, Christ gave what is his fully. And Christ gave the fullest power, which whole and entire he has left in sacrament and power to Peter and to his church. And Chrysostom says to the Bulgarian delegation, I now confirm in you that which is fully mine. Chapter 35, that the Roman pontiff enjoys the same power conferred on Peter by Christ. The canon of the Council of Chalcedon, note, says, 
If any bishop is sentenced as guilty of infamy, he's free to appeal the sentence to the blessed bishop of old Rome, whom we have as Peter, the rock of refuge, and to him alone, in place of God, with unlimited power, is granted the authority to hear the appeal of a bishop accused of infamy in virtue of the keys given him by the Lord. And further on, and whatever has been decreed by him is to be held as from the vicar of the apostolic throne. Likewise, Cyril, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, says, speaking in the person of Christ, that he will give authority with all those whom I shall put in your place. And Cyril of Alexandria also speaks of how Peter and his church are in the place of the Lord. And further on, to Peter, all by divine ordinance bow the head, and the rulers of the world obey him as the Lord Jesus himself. And finally, Chrysostom, speaking in the person of Christ, says, Feed my sheep, that is, in my place, be in charge of your brethren. Well, how could anyone possibly answer such a weighty and learned string of quotations, not from popes, you notice, but from fathers and councils all outside of Rome? Well, with the exception of this last quote by Chrysostom that we'll come back to in a few minutes, all of those other quotations are forgeries, fathers and councils alike. Today, they are universally recognized by all to be forgeries, but at the time, the Orthodox Church must have been absolutely mystified when they, re when they read through these words and compared them to their own copies of the canons and the fathers. What was Aquinas talking about? Thomas Aquinas was an outstanding scholar, but it's important to understand when reading him today that your scholarship is only as good as your sources. He naturally relied on what he'd been given, and these forgeries played an important role in the schism of the church, even to this day. All those quotes gathered by Aquinas, and many, many more like them, are found among the thousands and thousands of pages of forgeries that were made over many centuries by a wide variety of authors, both in and out of Rome, that amount to nothing less than a reinvention of history. These forgeries include fictitious synods, and canons, and letters, and biographies of popes, and histories of the church, and much, much more. And no matter the origin or original purpose of these forgeries, the effect was to mislead the whole Western church. I'm going to give you the names of a few of these many forgeries, using the names from the Catholic Encyclopedia that you can look up on your own. But a few examples among many are the Symmachian forgeries. This substantial collection was uh, presumably composed by the supporters of Pope Symmachus, who reigned from 498 to 514. One of the most famous quotes of that collection is that the first see is judged by no one. That's quoted verbatim in canon law to this very day. Or Epistle 26 says, The see of the blessed Peter the Apostle has the right to judge the whole church, Neither is it lawful for anyone to judge its judgment. There are, secondly, the forgeries of Pseudo-Isidore. That includes several works in the collection, but especially the false decretals of Isidore. Uh, those false decretals included 60 decrees or letters attributed to popes from the time of Clement to Melchiades. Of those 60, 58 are forgeries. It also includes a history of the early church with edited canons of 54 councils. Uh, it has a history that sketches the image of the church as a uh, church in a golden age, as it's been called, under the leadership of Rome. It uh, also includes 33 letters of popes from Sylvester to Gregory II, of which 30 of the 33 are outright forgeries. These massive collections of forgeries are mixed with actual co quotations from councils and papal decretals, Roman law, writings of church fathers, and so forth. And here's how it's done. When a historian says that there was a synod at a certain place at a certain time, 
the false decretals will manufacture the decrees for the missing counsel. If there is some reference to a letter being written, the forger writes that letter. The pseudo Isidorian decretals had a huge impact in the West. For example, they invented and then projected back into history the office of primate ruling over the metropolitans. They refer to archbishops, primates, and patriarchs as if they had existed from the very beginning of the church. They forbid any council without permission from Rome to meet, and they represent appeals to Rome as the normal pattern of history. These forgeries amount to thousands and thousands of pages. Number three, the Liber Pontificalis, the first part of that, I should say, was put together around the time of Pope Symmachus from uh, many sources, again, both real and apocryphal, integrated together, including many forged letters and papal decretals, even inventing synods and decrees. It's represented as a complete history of the bishops of Rome, beginning, of course, with the first bishop, Peter. To be clear, from the second century, there were lists of Roman bishops that went back to the apostles, and that idea proved to be a very powerful argument against the Gnostic false gospels and other apocryphal writings. For example, if a Gnostic gospel of Peter or apocalypse of Peter were real, then why did Rome never hear about them? Rome, the church founded by Peter, where he served as the first bishop. The irony is that those lists and histories of the bishops of Rome that went back to the apostles themselves were relying on apocryphal works, such as the Acts of Peter, or a long list of similar writings that enjoyed a wide circulation in the second century and afterward. Probably the most famous forgery of all is called, number four, the Donation of Constantine, which was completed sometime before 754. It tells how the 4th century emperor supposedly gave the Pope supremacy over all the world's churches and their estates, including the primacy of power and jurisdiction over the four patriarchs and all the bishops of the world. Constantine gives the Pope control of the Lateran Palace in Rome and the regions of the Western Empire so that the Pope has the right to appoint political rulers. The Pope enjoys the same privileges as the Emperor, among them the right to wear an imperial crown. But as Pope Sylvester refused to put on his head a golden crown, the Emperor invested him then with the right to wear the white cap called the Phrygium. It concludes with maledictions against all those who dare to violate these donations and with the assurance that the Emperor has signed them with his own hand and placed them on the tomb of St. Peter himself. The donation of Constantine and the false decretals were exposed in 1440 AD. However, Vala and his book were placed on the index and it took many years before anyone agreed that these were in fact forgeries. Now, of course, things are different. Many, many forgeries, including these, are discussed openly in the Catholic Encyclopedia, but the point is that these forgeries in their day played a major role in real history of the Church, and those effects are still felt today. How were they felt? Well, they had a lot to do with, number one, the Great Schism, the division of the Church, East and West. When the Patriarch of Constantinople closed the Latin churches in his city for the innovation of using unleavened bread, Pope Leo IX responded by sending a letter to the Emperor asserting his universal reign over the whole church and citing a large number of passages from the Donation of Constantine. Later in the Photian Schism, Pope Nicholas claimed that Ignatius could not be deposed without the permission of the Pope, and that the Pope could overrule any Episcopal trial, even without an appeal. The rest of the Church was simply astonished at these claims that came from forgeries. They had no idea what the Latins were talking about, what they were quoting, or what they were reading from. Pope Nicholas insisted that calling a general church council 
was the prerogative only of Rome. Still the Catholic position today, of course. This was not only an invention of pseudo-Isidore, but it was also contrary to all history. For, in fact, all ecumenical councils had been called by the emperor, except for Nicaea II, which had been called by the Patriarch of Constantinople. But Rome was on the road to schism with other churches who they considered to be rebellious and schismatic for rejecting what they thought were actual canons and councils. These forged claims perpetuated then the great schism after it happened, for example, at the Council of Florence in the 15th century, which was aiming at reunion. The Roman Catholic strategy was simply to inundate the Orthodox with a massive amount of patristic texts and quotation of councils, such as the famous forged acts of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which supposedly had St. Teresius say that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son, as opposed to what the genuine acts said from the Father through the Son, and so on. Well, so many of those quotations were in fact forgeries. Much, much more could be said, but we go on to the Gregorian reforms, the Dictatus Papi in particular, from 1075 or so, that's attributed to Gregory VII, it made a large number of claims for the Pope, such as that the Pope alone can depose or reinstate bishops, um, which was contrary to the historical practice of the Church. It even gives the Pope the right to depose emperors and said that princes must kiss the feet of the, pe of the Pope alone. Well, of the 27 titles in the Dictatus, Seven of them borrow from or allude to the false decretals, seven from the donation of Constantine, three from the pseudo samachian forgeries, and so forth. In general, the Gregorian reforms solidified the Roman bishops' universal and immediate primacy of power, and so did more than many other things to solidify the great schism east and west. The third way it still has effects is in canon law. In the 11th century, those false decretals were combined with the donation of Constantine, the Liber Pontificalis, and many other forgeries, and many other true quotations to form an integrated system of canon law. The decretum was published in 1151 and quickly became the standard of canon law, teaching the scholastics, including Aquinas, much of which they knew about the church fathers and councils to that point. The eminent Roman Catholic historian Joseph von Dollinger wrote, quote, no book ever came so near it in its influence in the church. The Decretum quotes popes from the first four centuries 324 times, of which 313 are forgeries. Fourth, the Protestant Reformation. After Valla in the 15th century exposed a few famous forgeries, there was a great flurry of interest in finding and exposing others. Valla's book was prohibited, but it didn't stop other scholars who wanted to learn just how far the forgeries went. And so a flurry of Greek manuscripts and Greek teachers also were coming to teach at the universities of the West after the fall of Constantinople now no longer relying on compiled quotations or translated works, many began voraciously reading the Church Fathers and the Bible in the original Greek. It's been said that their slogan was ad fontes, back to the original sources. Which sources were authentic documents? And do the authentic documents support papal claims? What did the Church Fathers mean in the original language? in the context of the original works and the times. Well, people and scholars chose sides, and by the early 16th century, the church, was, the church was ripe for another schism. Many of those scholars became reformers. They assailed the use of forgeries and their use by Gregory VII in particular, and they did not rely on the florilegia or the thesaurus of quotations to know what the fathers said they abandoned the quote lists and read the originals. And so, for example, at the early debate uh, at Lucerne, called the Lucerne Disputation, 
the Roman Catholic theologian Mimard gave a speech and said that the reformers Borel, Vire, and Calvin pretend to be wiser and more enlightened by the Holy Spirit than the holy doctors, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, St. Ambrose, St. Gregory. Well, Calvin, who'd remained quiet for four days, stood up and answered, Those who make a pretense of holding the fathers in great reverence frequently honor them less than we do, and would not deign to employ in reading their works the time which we gladly devote to it. I will lay before you only a small number of passages of such a character as there will be nothing left for you to reply to. And then, without notes, quoting from memory, Tertullian, Chrysostom, Augustine, uh, giving the reference where it to be found, concluding, And when you taunt us with a charge that the ancients are against us, everyone sees your rashness. Assuredly, if you had only read a few pages, you would not have been so bold. But you have not even seen the covering of the book. The city of Lausanne devoted to go, pro voted to go Protestant. Fifth, Roman Catholic councils. Roman Catholic councils not only built their theology on canon law, discussed earlier, but even from time to time include, included forged references from fathers and councils to justify their positions. For example, the Catechism of the Council of Trent says, quote, By Christ were also ordained, as St. Fabian, pontiff of Rome, testifies, the right of chrism and the words which the Catholic Church uses in its administration. Those were forgeries. In general, Rome tended to include quotations from fathers and councils in their documents. And to this day, when Roman apologists especially produce lists of quotations that have been passed down, well, often there is some mixture. Aquinas himself was relying in part on, collecting, on, on the collection of others. But someone will ask, surely there are many, many real quotes from fathers and councils that Ratzinger and the others must be ignoring. I mean, even Aquinas had that one solid quote from Chrysostom on which he could at least rest his case. Well, let's consider now the second thing that helped to divide the church, the problem of translation. Let's go back down and pick up that quote from Thomas Aquinas as he cited John Chrysostom. And I've put the full sentence here from the English translation at newadvent.org where Chrysostom writes, Jesus puts into Peter's hands the chief authority among the brethren and says, if you love me, preside over your brethren. Well, someone says, if this quote is genuine, it is devastating. It absolutely settles at least that Chrysostom believed that Peter was given the primacy of power over the apostles. And yet, we have to ask, how should we translate that highlighted word, which occurs in Greek here, both as a verb and a participle or a verbal noun? That uh, word can in context mean to preside over, and it can also mean to care for or devote yourself to, which you can see from another Chrysostom sermon, also on New Advent. Whatever reason, New Advent gives the Greek word right in its English translation in Homilies on Acts by Chrysostom. So this is not my edition, the word in parentheses, prostasian. We read, Peter presented Dorcas alive to some for comfort because they received back their sister and because they saw the miracle, and for kindly support, prostasian, to others. Well, here's the same word. Here, prostasian is not translated having chief authority, but kindly support. That's a very big difference. This word has a range of meaning and has to be translated based on context. So we might ask, what is the context of the passage from John's gospel that Chrysostom was expounding? Well, Jesus was telling Peter, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Here's how translation issues helped open a gulf between Rome 
and the Greek-speaking churches of the East. The Greek churches read this and understood care or kindly support. A later Latin, Latin translator rendered the same word, chief authority, and preside over your brethren. Translation issues are a common problem in church history, and this problem often builds on itself when something is translated from Greek, then to Latin, and then again to a modern language. For example, in various places, Peter can go from being the first of the disciples in Greek to being the princeps in Latin, which is then often rendered prince in English, the prince of the apostles. Well, it ends up sounding very different than the original context and translation. Well, we've considered the problem of forgeries and the problem of translation, but someone will say, even if all this is so, surely there are many, many quotations from the church fathers that are absolutely genuine and translated acceptably. The answer, absolutely yes. And you might go, for example, to the Catholic Answers website or to Wikipedia or to any other popular source and there find updated lists of quotations without uh, these uh, errors we've been talking about, um, saying things like what the early church believed. So what about all these genuine quotations? Are Ratzinger and Congar and these other leaders ignoring such quotations? Or are they contradicting the fathers? No, not at all. So let's take this quote as an example of our third problem, the selective gathering of actual quotes. This is from a letter by one of the five patriarchs, Cyrus of Alexandria, a bishop. He writes to my master, honored by God, the good chief shepherd, the father of fathers. Contrary thoughts came into my mind as I was intending to extend the present report to my divinely honored master. I summoned the courage to write when I had taken to heart the inspired teachings of your thrice blessedness, being persuaded that one of the two, even both of them, would prevail with me. For either I said, I shall be accepted, or else I shall be completely corrected in what I report in this letter, being deemed worthy, O divinely honored one, of the all pious footsteps of our God-strengthened master. I was commanded to embark on reading the all-revered report of you, of your divinely inspired self, rather. I have learned to take refuge in your teaching, which speaks from God, even as I beg its precious and clearly instructive message to vouchsafe still brighter clarity. As a result, when our ignorance has been illuminated by your God-taught self, perhaps in this Two, we may in imitate the fat and fertile land. Now, my good master, I, humble Cyrus, praying for the all-esteemed well-being of my master, who is honored by God, composed this. Wow. Well, this seems like a total open and shut case. The smoking gun we've been looking for. So, from such a letter, we perhaps ought to conclude that the Bishop of Rome has universal power as the master over the other bishops and churches as the chief shepherd of the church, the father of fathers. We might conclude that he is infallible because his teachings are inspired and speak from God and because he is God taught and he tells the other patriarchs what they should believe. We should conclude that his teachings are binding and that other Christians throughout the whole world should also take refuge in his teaching, which speaks from God, and conclude that he has been given divine honors by God himself, who has upheld his holy footsteps. Well, Cyrus actually was not writing this to the Bishop of Rome. Cyrus was writing this to Sergius, the Bishop of Constantinople. The point of this is that whenever you read a quote, you not only need to make sure that it's authentic and translated accurately in context, you 
also need to be able to read a quote within the context of the rhetoric of the day. And I will give you many examples of this, but the point is, if you were only to gather such quotations as this about the Bishop of Rome and publish them in a long string of quotations, readers would be quite innocently misled. And by the way, despite all the nice things that the Bishop of Alexandria said about the Bishop of Constantinople, it was just a few decades later that Sergius was condemned as a heretic by an ecumenical council. So we need to take things in the context of the day. You might ask, what should we conclude when Chrysostom writes of that great apostle who was, quote, the pillar of the churches throughout the world, who holds the keys of heaven? This certainly sounds like a very strong endorsement of Peter's universal primacy of power, but Chrysostom, in fact, was not even writing about Peter. He was writing about John, the son of thunder, the beloved of Christ, the pillar of the churches throughout the world who holds the keys of heaven. Once again, you need to be able to read such quotations not only in the context of the document, but also in terms of the ordinary, often flowery rhetoric of the day. Here is from the letter of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Rejoice, O city of Zion, summit of the world and of the empire, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Another praising to Pope Agatho, what was put forward by the assistance of the life-giving spirit, a definition clean from all error, certain and infallible. Well, should we conclude from such quotes that the Pope is divinely infallible or that the gates of hell should not prevail against the office of Peter in the city of Rome? Now, as you've probably already guessed, that first quote is being written to the emperor, not to the Bishop of Rome at all. And the second quote isn't about the infallibility of the Pope, it's about the infallibility of the council informing him of what they had decided. Well, many scholars have noted that in these days, divine, infallible, Holy Spirit inspiration was in the air. It was a staple of ancient church rhetoric. Such Holy Spirit, divine inspiration was attributed even to the government. No surprises this time. This is from a letter that Pope Agatho wrote praising the Holy Spirit-inspired imperial decrees of the emperor, Constantine IV. He wrote of these decrees, the Holy Spirit, by his grace, dictated to the tongue of the imperial pen, out of the treasure of a pure heart and so forth. The point is, inspiration in those days was in the air. The emperor was inspired. The councils had it. The bishops had it. Even the Bishop of Rome had it. This was the rhetoric of the time. However, if you were only to gather quotes like this about the Bishop of Rome and ignore the quotes about all the others, it might sound as though the Bishop of Rome was the only one inspired by the Holy Spirit in his writings. problem is not only selective quotations from the fathers, but also the selective reading of history. For example, several lists that I checked on contained quotes from Cyprian and his contemporary bishop, Firmilian, like these two quotes that I've taken from Catholic Answers. Cyprian wrote, Primacy is given to Peter, whereby it's made clear that there is but one church and one chair. If someone doesn't hold fast this unity of Peter, can he imagine that he still holds the faith? If he should desert the chair of Peter, upon whom the church was built, can he still be confident that he is in the church? From Cyprian's work on church unity, first edition noted here, AD 251. Joined to it is this quote from Vermilion, Pope Stephen I boasts of the place of his episcopate and contends that he holds the succession from Peter, on whom the foundations of the church were laid. Pope Stephen announces that he holds by succession the throne of Peter. 
this from Cyprian's letters number 74. These quotes are particularly important for a variety of reasons, especially because they are early. If the teachings of the Vatican councils that we read at the beginning are in fact apostolic tradition, then we would expect to find obedience to Rome demonstrated by bishops in every part of the world from the time of the apostles onward. There might be a few exceptions, of course, but the evidence should be quite overwhelming throughout the whole church, and especially in councils, when the church comes together to define the faith and discipline and morals of the church, then we would especially expect them, expect them to affirm and operate under Roman primacy of power. The Roman Catholic scholars earlier noted a lack of such testimony early on, and uh, as far as I know, these quotes do represent the earliest testimony of a claim to anything approaching Vatican I. This is from the day of Stephen I, the Bishop of Rome, who reigned between 254 and 257 or thereabouts, and these quotes are certainly very strong and convincing, so we must look into them a little. Cyprian had defended Pope Stephen against the claims of the heretic Novation, and then a little later, a controversy arose whether the baptism of heretics was valid, and whether they in fact had to be rebaptized into the Catholic Church. Pope Stephen said the baptism of heretics was valid, but then he moved to excommunicate those who disagreed and did rebaptize heretics. Well, there was nothing new about bishops excommunicating other bishops, sometimes even for trivial reasons. But the critical point here is the reason that Stephen gave when he wrote to the churches. He said that since he held his office in succession from Peter, that he had the rule over other bishops. That's the key point. And that's why it's very important in church history and shows up still on many quote minds today. Cyprian Bishop of Carthage, received the letter, and called a council of 87 North African bishops, the acts of which are readily available online. He rejected Roman intervention and writes here for the council, for neither does any of us set himself up as a bishop of bishops, nor by tyrannical terror does any compel his colleague to the necessity of obedience, since every bishop, according to the allowance of his liberty and power, has his own proper right of judgment, and can no more be judged by another than he himself can judge another. But let us all wait for the judgment of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only one who has the power both of preferring us in the judgment of his church, excuse me, in the government of his church, and of judging us in our conduct there. This North African council felt absolutely no compulsion to obey or agree with the decision of Rome, and simply replied that the Bishop of Rome had no authority to condemn what they were doing in Carthage. Cyprian's own maxim is, all bishops are equal. Someone will ask, um, is this just the impudence of one schismatic council? Not at all. Then Cyprian wrote to various leading bishops in the East, he sent them a copy of Pope Stephen's threatening letter and their own council's judgment on the matter and his work on church unity. Firmilian, the Bishop of Caesarea from 232 to 269 or so, the one that was quoted earlier, wrote back, and here's the whole quote from Firmilian. I am justly indignant at this so open and manifest folly of Stephen that he who so boasts of the place of his episcopate and contends that he holds the succession from Peter, on whom the foundations of the church were laid, should introduce many other rocks and establish new buildings of many churches, maintaining that there is baptism in them by his authority, Stephen, who announces that he holds by succession the throne of Peter. When you read the whole quote, it sounds rather different, but he's not done. And Vermillion goes on to say, as if to Pope Stephen himself, For what strifes and dissensions have you stirred up throughout the churches of the whole world? Moreover, 
How great sin have you heaped up for yourself when you cut yourself off from so many flocks, for it is yourself that you have cut off. Do not deceive yourself, since he is really the schismatic who has made himself an apostate from the communion of ecclesiastical unity. For while you think that all may be excommunicated by you, you have excommunicated yourself alone from all. And Vermilion is not done yet. He then joins Cyprian and the Council of Carthage in rejecting Stephen's claim that he was maintaining apostolic tradition by not baptizing heretics. As a matter of fact, Vermilion says he had already participated in a council in Iconium where the bishops of Galatia and Cilicia and other provinces had already affirmed the need to rebaptize heretics. Vermilion writes, Stephen has said, as though the apostles forbade those who come from heresy to be baptized, and delivered this also to be observed by their successors. And later, they who are at Rome do not observe those things in all cases which are handed down from the beginning, and vainly pretend the authority of the apostles. And again, very many of us meeting together in Iconium very carefully examined the matter, and we decided that every baptism was altogether to be rejected, which is done outside the church. Vermilion was not the only one to weigh in. In Egypt, Dionysius, the Bishop of Alexandria, decided to write directly to Pope Stephen about this and urging him to come back to apostolic tradition. He writes, if then it was from the apostles, as we said above, that this custom took its beginning, we must adjust ourselves thereto. Whatsoever may have been their reasons and the grounds on which they acted, to the end that we too may observe the same in accordance with their practice. For as to things which were written afterward and which are until now still found, they're ignored by us and let them be ignored no matter what they are. How can these comply with the customs of the ancients? Well, the point is that none of these churches felt any need to submit to Rome's judgment, and they did not allow Rome to, comp to claim apostolic tradition. These were no exception. Although many churches from time to time sought to advise, sometimes meddle in, even from time to time condemn other churches and bishops, which was their right to do, we find churches disputing with Rome, and they knew no apostolic tradition of Roman supremacy. Now, after all this, someone will ask, what about that quote then? Did Cyprian really say that primacy is given to Peter and whoever deserts the chair of Peter upon whom the church is built, has he the confidence that he's still in the church? Well, some manuscripts of his book on church unity have those words and some don't. The older theory is that Cyprian's writings, like so many of the other ancient works, were later revised and embellished with papal claims. The newer theory is that Cyprian himself published a second edition uh, without these lines, which is why Cyprian's work is quoted in the Catholic Answers tract with that speculative title, first edition. That's one theory. Here is the opposite theory, this from the old Catholic encyclopedia on newadvent.com that Cyprian added the part about Peter's primacy and chair in the margins of his first edition. Well, in either case, Cyprian and Firmilian cannot be used to support papal supremacy when we know something about their true history. Cyprian is clear that all bishops are the successors of Peter, and when the Lord said, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, he was not describing one Roman bishop, but the honor of all bishops, and affirmed that the church is founded upon the bishops. Well, in general, we've seen that we must not be selective in our readings of the church fathers. We need to believe them when they say that the Pope was given the primacy of honor. 
and we need to believe them when they say that the Pope has equal power and authority with other bishops. We should note when they tell us that the Pope intruded into the affairs outside of his jurisdiction. And we should also note when they tell us that those intrusions were strongly rejected. We need to appreciate the glowing sentiments when they say that the Bishop of Rome's faith is unblemished. And we need to appreciate their harsh condemnations when they say that the Pope has fallen into heresy. And so, the various ecumenical statements by Catholic leaders that we read at the beginning are saying that simply we must accept the Church as it actually was and not rely upon selective readings of certain quotes in translation out of context. Well, let's review then what we've covered so far. We've considered the teaching of the Vatican Councils in particular regarding the Church and the Pope's supremacy over it, that Roman Catholic Gospel distinctive, and the way in which it is known to out, throughout all the churches of the world, as they put it. On the other hand, we saw the Chieti document giving us an outline of what Cardinal Ratzinger called the doctrine of primacy that had been formulated and lived for the first millennium, which did not include the papal supremacy over the East, and we saw why the Church of the East should be considered both orthodox and legitimate in the form that she has always had. We learned how forgeries distorted the Latin Church's understanding of its own theology and history by the end of the first millennium, and this influencing the Great Schism, the Gregorian reforms, canon law, the writings of the scholastics, the Protestant Reformation, subsequent councils and dogma, and apologetics down to this day. And we saw how those forgeries, and to a lesser extent issues in translation, first drove a wedge between East and West, and then later helped drive the wedge between Protestants and Roman Catholics as Renaissance scholars began again reading the complete works of the Church Fathers in the original language, context, and history of the time. And we spent a few minutes considering the important example of Cyprian and Firmilian to illustrate the importance of reading in context and history. The final example that we'll be considering today is controversial, and not for the sake of controversy, but simply to illustrate how this continues to be controversial today. The Church's past at a popular level is a matter of disagreement, and because of those disagreements, there continue to be divisions today. So let's consider this quotation that often comes up, and this is from Pope Damasus I, as found in the decrees of the Roman Council of AD 382. Here it is as printed in a tract on the Catholic Answers website, which also, I should note, displays the official Roman imprimatur and the nihil obstat. The tract is called, What the Early Church Believed, Peter's Successors. The quote from Pope Damasus in particular says, Likewise, it is decreed we have considered that it ought to be announced that the Holy Roman Church has been placed at the forefront, not by the conciliar decisions of other churches, but has received the primacy of the evangelic voice of our Lord and Savior, who says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and so forth. Well, here is one of the strongest early statements of Rome's divine prerogative, it says that Rome's primacy has come from the Lord through Peter and has not come from councils, which you remember uh, the council said that Rome had been placed first because it was an imperial city. So I need to point out that a great many Roman Catholics have been taught about this Roman council of 382, not because of this quote so much, but because Pope Damasus also in that same council defined the canon of scripture to be what it still is today in the Roman Church. So, although it was a local council, it's an extremely significant one. But is the Roman Council of 382 real? Now, so far, all the forgeries that I've discussed are universally recognized and described as forgeries in the Catholic Encyclopedia and elsewhere. But I'd like 
to bring our study up to date now by considering a more modern and therefore a more controversial example of our problem. So let me tell you the story. In 1794, a Jesuit scholar named Faustino Aravallo called the church's attention to a manuscript which claimed to contain the decrees of a Roman council, a council that wasn't included in the standard collections of Dionysius Exiguus or of Cassidorius. Aravallo's manuscript said that its three chapters were the decrees of Pope Damasus from a council in Rome. Now, it's important to point out that there were many other longer manuscripts of the same decree around in which these were the first three of a five-chapter papal decree that was attributed to Pope Galatius from the end of the 5th century, a hundred years later. In fact, in some manuscripts, those five chapters were said to be the decree of Pope Hormistus in the 6th century. Sometimes it was anonymous. But Aravallo's manuscript had only the first three chapters as a separate decree of Pope Damasus, who reigned in Rome in the 4th century. So Aravallo's theory was that these three chapters must have been a separate earlier decree by a council under Pope Damasus, which then later was confirmed and added to by Pope Galatius and maybe Hormistus or other later popes. So did Damasus convene a local synod in Rome? Most unusually, the manuscript did not have a council date. However, elsewhere, there was a passing reference to a gathering of the brethren in Rome in 382 AD, which was during the papacy of Damasus. So putting that letter together with this decree, Aravello advanced a theory that these three chapters must have been the decrees of a council held in 382 in Rome. And here are the three chapters of Aravello's manuscript. They start off admittedly um, sounds a little strange for a council uh, affirming the sevenfold spirit which remains in Christ and the name of many forms and how the Holy Spirit is not of the Father only or of the Son only but of the Father and the Son. Here is chapter 2 which lists out the books of the Bible as they are still received today by the church in Rome. I will note that it includes Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, Tobit, Judith, and Maccabees, these deuterocanonical books. And likewise, here in chapter 3, we have some important content. For in this third and final chapter, it affirms, as we've seen, that the Holy Roman Church is given first place by the rest of the churches without the need of a synodical decision, but from the voice of the Lord, our Savior, in the gospel, obtain primacy, you are Peter, and so forth. Um, in the uh, second paragraph, it affirms that uh, the Lord made the Holy Roman Church special and gave preference to them over all other before all other cities and so forth well Aravello said here is the earliest affirmation of the Roman Catholic canon of scripture and here is this important early affirmation that Rome was given first place not by some synod but by the Lord himself through Peter without the need of a synod and scholars began to pay much more attention to this decree. So that in the 20th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, an article on this decree was published by a Roman Catholic scholar in the very first volume of the Ecumenical Journal of Theological Studies, 1912. And this was then subject to a withering critique, exposing all five of the chapters of this decree as a fraud using the same means as the other writings described earlier were likewise exposed. 
for example, here's chapter one again, in this part most strongly associated with the fourth century Pope Damasus and a council at the end of the fourth century. Um, almost all of point three is plagiarized word for word from a fifth century book by Augustine called Tractates on the Gospel of John, um, available at the new Advent link below. Also, here in chapter 2, we are told by the heading that we'll, we're going to be informed not only the scriptures that the church receives, but also what it's required to avoid. Now you remember that in Aravello's manuscript, there were only three chapters. However, the list of books to avoid isn't given until chapter five. In other words, whoever published the first three chapters as a separate document and attributed them to Pope Damasus didn't notice that a heading in chapter two referenced to a list that wasn't coming until chapter five. There are many, many more textual issues, anachronisms, and other errors throughout the decree. The same kinds of things that characterize other known forgeries from this period, not only in the three earlier chapters attributed to Pope Damasus, but even in those chapters four and five, which are most associated with Pope Galatius. For example, uh, Sterius's book is listed in chapter four, a book that he published after he retired from being consul in 496 AD, which was two years too late for an approval by a Roman synod in Galatius in 494. Well, the German scholar Dobschutz published a massive 357-page critical study. He patiently examined the 86 manuscripts of this decree, including the four shorter manuscripts of only three chapters that claimed to be the decree of Pope Damasus, all of which were dated to the 8th or 9th centuries. And his book, Das Decretum Galatianum, is freely available online and provides a thorough examination of the textual issues. I might suggest, however, starting with a 17-page journal article called The Decretal of Damasus by Howorth. Link is below. But in addition, there are several problems outside the text. For example, the great 6th century scholar Dionysius Exiguus published the earliest collection of Latin canons and decretals. Now, Dionysius knew Pope Galatius, and he arrived in Rome before his death. He was commissioned by his successor to organize and publish the archives of the decrees and councils of Rome. So we must ask, how could this excellent scholar, who was in Rome at that time, forget to include such an important decree by Pope Damasus that had been supposedly confirmed by Pope Galatius? Dionysius Exiguus did give us other decrees from Pope Galatius, but about this decree, long or short, from a council under Damasus or Galatius, he says nothing. And why didn't any other writers or historians between the 4th and 8th centuries mention that Rome had formulated a list of canonical books, except that they never heard of such a decree from either Pope or anyone else. And then above all this, we have the writings of Jerome. Jerome attended the Council of Constantinople in 381 and then went from there to Rome, where Pope Damasus commissioned him to revise the Old Latin Bible and to produce a new translation, which we call the Vulgate. Now, Jerome doesn't say a word in all of his writings about any Roman council which listed the books of the canon, even though he was in the city of Rome at that very time that the Council of 382 was supposedly held. But more than an argument from silence, we have Jerome's own introduction to the books of the Vulgate. Now, if Rome had actually ruled that these books were to be in the canon not ten years earlier, why would Jerome publish this in his introduction to the historical books of the Vulgate? The prologue to the scriptures may be appropriate as a 
helmeted introduction to all the books which we turn from Hebrew into Latin so we may be able to know whatever is outside of these is set aside among the Apocrypha. Therefore, wisdom, which is commonly ascribed to Solomon, and the book of Jesus, son of Sirach, and Judith, and Tobias, and the shepherd, are not in the canon. Likewise, in his preface to the wisdom books of the Vulgate, he writes, as then the church reads Judith, Tobit, and the books of Maccabees, but does not admit them among the canonical scriptures, so let it also read these two volumes, that is the wisdom of Solomon and Ecclesiasticus, for the edification of the people, not to give authority to doctrines of the church. So the question is, how could Jerome, who was commissioned by the Pope, to whom he was so especially devoted, and who was in Rome in 382 AD, have written that the books in Rome's canonical list were in fact not canonical and not authoritative for doctrines of the church and never give any word of explanation. Well, many other issues are raised in the articles and sources previously mentioned. So then, since the Roman Council in 382 was not even proposed as a theory until the end of the 18th century, and since its alleged decrees were so thoroughly discredited by multiple scholars in ecumenical journals over a hundred years ago, someone might wonder why this is still quoted as fully authoritative today. This example illustrates that there remains different understandings of history based on different sources today, and that scholars tend to be rather far ahead of the average church member or priest or apologist who relies only on a list of quotations. In summary, then, we've learned that Roman Catholic councils require their members to believe that the ancient and constant faith of the universal church is that Rome was given a primacy of jurisdiction by the Lord himself through Peter, and that this primacy establishes the unity and solidity of the entire church. From this faith, no one can deviate without the loss of faith and salvation. On the other hand, we've seen that Roman Catholic scholars, such as those in Chieti and Joseph Ratzinger, acknowledged that this faith was particularly from the 4th century professed in Rome, but was not adopted in the East, that this was a primacy of honor, quoting the Council of Chalcedon, the fathers accorded prerogatives to Rome since that is an imperial city, but they deny that Rome ever exercised canonical authority over the churches of the East. That idea grew up later. The Church of the East rather should be recognized as orthodox and legitimate in the form she has always had. We then considered the various reasons for this stark divide up to today, including a variety of forgeries, language issues, context, and the scholarly historical critical analysis of sources. And although the history of the church, as the scholars outline it, is generally known and accepted outside of Rome, and although the Chieti document in particular has been widely discussed among the Orthodox, nevertheless, for unknown reasons, these things are still generally unknown among Roman Catholics today. And part of the problem may be that the Church in Rome has not given its members a way to resolve this obvious tension between actual history and the dogma of councils that are regarded as infallible and irreformable. Vatican I again, we judge it to be necessary to propose to the belief and acceptance of all the faithful in accordance with the ancient and constant faith of the universal church, the doctrine con touching the institution, perpetuity, and nature of the sacred apostolic primacy. So then they say, if anyone says that the Roman pontiff has not the full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the whole church, and this not only in matters of faith and morals, but also in those which concern the discipline and government of the church dispersed throughout the whole world, and over all and each of the pastors and faithful, let him be anathema. This is the teaching of Catholic truth from which no one can deviate without loss of faith and salvation.
So in conclusion, here is the dilemma for Roman Catholics today. How to reconcile the statements of Rome's councils, which are regarded as having infallible divine authority, with the statements of Rome's scholars, which have no canonical authority, but which are increasingly being accepted. And Roman Catholic scholars are surely correct that we cannot expect unity in the future by trying to persuade others of a non-existent past. Any hope must lie in the truth and in biblical synodality. The Church of Rome had truly been a strong force for unity and a voice for truth in days past, and many today in Rome are calling for a return to promoting unity in the truth. But can that be done? That is the question today. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this second lesson in this series on understanding Roman Catholic distinctives.